So it, it's really my great honor and, and pleasure to introduce two of my friends uh, who also happen to be our next presenters, uh, Kevin Tomasek and Kevin Scanlon. Uh, we've taken the calling them the Kevins at the center. Uh, they're good friends. They're both from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and they are both fantastic photographers whose work will be featured in our new book, The Railroad and the Art of Place, an anthology. There's good reason they're going to be featured in that book. These are both men who make deep connections with places and who then explore those places deeply. And as a preview for our new book, uh, we've asked them to share some of their favorite places with you today. Kevin Tomasek lives in Pittsburgh's Mount Troy neighborhood, overlooking the Allegheny River and the old Pittsburgh and Western main line of the BNO. Railroads and industry are his favorite pastimes, along with playing any dog he might happen to meet, it's a man after my own heart. He is the proud father to two grown sons, and he shares custody of a miniature snouter named Ellie with his girlfriend, Carol. And she's also his editor, uh, Carol, uh, not Ellie, the dog. <laughs> Although dogs can be good editors too, I think. Uh, as a rail fan, Kevin was so smitten by the steel industry that he made a career in it. He has been an industrial furnace estimator and project manager for more than 30 years, and he'll share that journey with you in his presentation called Insider to Outsider. Uh, Kevin Scanlon is someone I met 20 years ago this very month uh, in the very best possible way while chasing a coal train on the former Virginian Railway deep in the hollers of southern West Virginia. I grew up in West Virginia, uh, but Kevin helped me to truly see it. He has spent the last 50 years documenting heavy industry and railroads across the country. His photographs have been in gallery exhibits, books, magazines, and even the literary journal Paper Street. Kevin lives in Pittsburgh with his wife, Dory Adams. He has recently retired and spends much of his time doing volunteer work at the Cary Blast Furnaces, the Rivers of Steel Archives, and the East Broad Top Railroad. Kevin's going to take us to Thurman, West Virginia today. Over the past 36 years, he's been there 72 times. We couldn't ask for a better guide. Please welcome Kevin Tomasek and Kevin Scanlon. Thank you. Thank you. Take it away, gentlemen. Kevin T, are you up first? Yeah, I'm going to. Uh, there's there's no way I'm following you. You know, I told you that already. <laughs> so let's see. I got to get my screen and share my screen, I guess, at this point. Yeah, you should have the uh, button down at the bottom. There we go. Now I got to get my screen. Okay. <clears throat> Steel, if you grew up in Pittsburgh in the 60s and 70s, like Kevin, I you're did, not sharing your screen yet. Oh, I thought I have it. Hit that share button, then select your presentation from the oh. screen options. How's that? That's there good. Go. There we go. Sorry about that, guys. No okay. worries. Problem. Dinosaurs. <laughs> no, that looks great now. Okay. <clears throat> Steel, if you grew up in Pittsburgh in the 60s and 70s like I did, it was everywhere. Whether you were dodging big trucks hauling coils or listening to the whistle sounding shift change or smelling the sulfur from coke making, you knew what drove the economy in the tri-state area. The two dailies, the Press and the Post-Gazette, most every day had stories of steel plant production, layoffs, hiring, other labor issues, you name it. U.S. Steel, the biggest steel maker in the U.S., was headquartered here and had the tallest building on the skyline. When I started taking pictures in the 70s with my three best friends, Kevin Scanlon, Keith Klaas, and Jim Ruffing, we used the steel mills as a backdrop for shooting the trains that served them. Back then, we were outsiders. Luckily, I was able to become an insider, and I am happy to share my experience with you. Before I begin, I must tip my hat to David Plowden, whose book, Steel, published in 1981, was groundbreaking. He did what few photographers had done before. He got inside steel plants and brought them to life with his photography. This made me want to do the same. Mr. Plowden opened my eyes with his magnificent work. I was very fortunate to meet him at a CRRPA conference a few years back and even got him to autograph my copy of Steel. We begin with a photograph inspired by Mr. Plowden at Bethlehem Steel in Johnstown, PA. Here's a look down the street at that most recognizable structure in a big steel plant, the blast furnace. These are the heart of an integrated plant, and they are where iron is made from ore, oak, and limestone. By the time Keith and I got there, the furnace was cold. 
but remained an impressive sight. We knew the plant wouldn't be standing for long, so we documented it as best we could. And I've chosen to start in the Ohio River Valley and wander down, south, down both sides of the river to Pittsburgh's Point, where we'll make an easy right turn and follow the Monongahela River. The Mon, as it's known, was lined with steel plants from almost downtown Pittsburgh all the way to Allenport, PA. Great companies <clears throat> such as U.S. Steel, Jones and & Laughlin, and Pittsburgh Steel call this river valley their home. Our first stop is Crucible Steel in Midland, PA, and their last surviving blast furnace. How'd you like this to be the view from your front porch? Moving further up the Ohio, we come to Aliquippa, home of the seven mile, yes, seven mile long JNL steel Aliquippa plant, home to five blast furnaces and its own railroad, the Aliquippa and Southern. One of their switchers here is shown hauling torpedo ladles from the blast furnace to the BOF furnaces. One of the, <clears throat> this was a big facility as all can see, and even more impressive during the winter with steam escaping everywhere. The last shot is of a PNLE train slowing to make a set off at JNL, their biggest customer. Penango Incorporated was located in the southern tip of Neville Island, just north of Pittsburgh, and was a rarity in the area. Even though they had Coke ovens and two blast furnaces, they didn't make steel. They are what is known as a merchant iron producer, making iron for the ingot mold foundry and selling the remainder to other foundries or steel makers. They also had their own railroad, the Pittsburgh and Ohio Valley, which rostered a small fleet of EMD switchers. Though US Steel was the biggest steel maker in time, they didn't actually have a plant within city limits. That was left to Jones and Lachlan, who made iron along 2nd Avenue and steel on the south side. The Ann Blast Furnace is shown here as she stood along 2nd Avenue. Most blast furnaces were named after women as a tribute to either the owners or the plant manager's wives. On the other side of the river was the steel making shop. By this time, the blast furnaces were cold and two big electric furnaces were here melting scrap to make slabs for other plants. At least two other crew, two crews from Monongahela Connecting were needed to move scrap laden gondolas around to feed these 300 ton monsters. The switcher looks lost in a sea of scrap cars. Once again, this is all gone now. It's been wiped out. Cary Furnace in Rankin, now a historical site. Actually, as Kevin said, he, uh, Scott said, Kevin and uh, Keith Kloss both volunteer here to as uh, docents, taking people around, showing them our uh, steel industry and how it grew up. They, uh, this site once had seven blast furnaces, and they took the iron from these plants across the river to Homestead, where it was made into steel over in the open hearth furnaces. This is the last two pair of furnaces that were uh, that were existing in the plant. And you can see in this shot, this is the Union Railroad and the Cary Furnace is in behind it. This bridge from Cary Furnace helped tie that furnace in with every other steel plant in the Mon Valley run by U.S. Steel. They had five plants and were all interconnected and interrelated. If one of the plants had a problem with production, they simply just moved the production, steel production or, or iron production to another plant. The last blast furnaces in the valley are down at U.S. Steel Edgar Thompson Works. Late in the day, a trio of Union Railroad SW 1500s do a bit of switching in the shadows of the mill. The plant makes iron and steel, which is fed to a continuous caster, making slabs for other U.S. steel facilities, mostly the urban works known as the mill on the hill. Duquesne, PA was a company town for U.S. steel. Old homes clung to the hills, which overlooked the plant. Though the plant was old, the last blast furnace in the valley, Dorothy 6, was constructed here in 1963 and makes for a beautiful site. This all has now been leveled. Keysport, also known as Tube City, was home to U.S. Steel's seamless and electro-weld pipe production. 
Morning finds us along the shared B&O and P&L E tracks, which run in front of the plant. The mill had its own railroad, the, Monog the McKeesport connecting, for a, which for a while ran the last two Alcos locomotives constructed in 1969, T6's 1016 and 1017. These still survive today on short lines. Further down the Mon lies Manesson, PA, home of Pittsburgh Steel, later Wheeling Pit Steel. They had an integrated plant here, and we see the Jane Blast Furnace with the USW Union Hall in the foreground. The exhaust stack here is for the BOS steel making shop where iron is turned into steel and cast into blooms or ingots. Notice the reddish cast of the exhaust smoke. <clears throat> the next three photos are of the PLE serving this mill. Back in the mid 80s, both the mill and the PLE GEU 28s were on short time, so I tried to get them as much as possible. On this day, I woke up early and called a dispatcher. Yes, you could do that then. Who told me they had a U28 leading an eastbound headed to Manesson. I asked my late wife Susie if she wanted to chase a train, and of course she said yes. Off we went. All it cost me was a coffee and a couple donuts. It was a great day following the Cobalt Blue River and listening to the bark of those U-boats. I started to become an insider when I got a job at Salem Furnace in the mid-80s. We built rigging furnace for steel mills worldwide, so that was a step in the right direction. Knowing that Sheriff Steel Mill in Sharon had a group of Baldwin S8s, I pitched an article to David P. Morgan at Trains and then had to figure out how to get into the plant. Luckily, the chief engineer at Salem had a buddy at Sharon Steel. A couple calls were made, and Keith Klaus and I got an invite to, quote, go anywhere you want. We had a driver and a pickup truck at our disposal. As you can see, we got down to see the loading of the iron down at the blast furnace. <clears throat> and saw them moving freshly stripped ingots. We even went, went to see the chief mechanical officer who apologized for the unit's appearance. They sit next to all that hot steel and it burns off the paint. Sorry, they don't look better. It was certainly okay with us. The next big draw in the area was Weirden Steel and West Virginia's Panhandle, owing to their having more than a dozen 539 engine Alco switchers on patrol in the mill. They were accessible either by city streets and alleys or by parking and taking a walk down the highway that went through the middle of the mill. The opening shot shows them pouring iron being poured into a torpedo ladle that was taken, and it was taken from one of these alleys. You could sit here, stand there for hours without being harassed, surrounded by the noise and smoke of a working furnace. Owing to other connections, I was finally able to become a real insider. The old Bethlehem Steel Johnstown plant had been reduced to just two operating units, Gautier Steel and Johnstown Wire Technologies. This occurred usually, probably around the turn of the century. And my company, CIC Pittsburgh, became the main furnace supplier to Gautier Steel, and we did multiple projects there. At the time, they had three bar mills, the 14-inch, the 12-inch, and the 9-inch. I usually tried to get to Johnstown early, hoping to catch the Connie Mon Black Lake short line, now run by Lehigh Rail. And these first couple of views show the, the Cambria City yard at dawn. After showing these photos to my boss, a Johnstown native, he said, now I see why you go there. The next shot shows a Connie Mon Black Lake switcher coming out from between a couple of mill buildings. As I was taking the shot, about five guys drove by heading to work in the mill, mostly laughing and shaking their heads. And a couple hollered, you taking pictures again? Those guys had me figured out. One advantage of being in the mill were the different views available, like this Connie Mon Blacklick man with a Johnson incline in the background, and the NS across the little Connie Ma River. My favorite mill was an Algon 12-inch mill. They rolled billets which were brought to the furnace by a mill dinky on two foot gauge tracks. Once the billets were pushed through the furnace, 
Once the bolts were pushed through the furnace, they were pushed out the back end to a hand mill where they were manhandled by a crew of 10 guys through multiple rolling stands until they had finished the product. The mill was historic and it had been in, in that had it been built in 1894 with a coal-fired reheat furnace. The 14-inch mill it got here was somewhat more modern, and here are two views of the control pulpits. The first view show the operator, Ronnie, hands on the peel bar control as he awaits a signal to push a hot billet out to Sarge on the mill side. Sarge is running a billet into the roughing mill in the second photo. All of this was coordinated with whistle treats, tweets. Both guys were very good to me, allowing them to invade their inner sanctums. Since it's a steel mill, the mill has parts laying all over the place, and you never know what you will find, like these big pinions. And finally, there's a, here's a torch cutter on the new plate mill. Another good customer is Franklin Steel and Franklin PA. As I was recently visiting, I was pleasantly surprised to run into two Alcos of the Western New York and Pennsylvania rolling by. Alcos and Steel, you can't beat that. Franklin Steel is owned by the Kowalczyk family of East Broadtop fame and rolls reclaimed railroad bar, railroad rail <coughs> into T bar and C channel fence posts. They line them up and walk them through a furnace, kick them out at 2200 degrees Fahrenheit, and then split them into head, web, and flange, rolling each simultaneously. This is a view of the overall view of the mill. The three three bars going through simultaneously. Sometimes things don't go to plan, and the bar doesn't end up hitting the mill in the correct way. You have what is known as a cobble. <clears throat> At that point, you've got to just pull everything apart, torch it, start all over again. The one advantage of my job. So once I'm done doing site buildings and such, I can kind of take my time and run around the countryside a little bit. And if I happen to get lucky and find a uh, train rolling through the area, I can follow it. And this happened to be one of those days where I knew the Western New York and Pennsylvania was out. So I caught him coming under the uh, exhaust ductwork for the, for the steel mill at Electroloy in Oil City, PA. Here's the locomotive coming past the whole mill shop. Some 20 years after going into Sharon Steel, I got to go back to the successor facility, NLMK. They now roll slabs imported from overseas. I included this shot because this is the stripper building where I had shot that follow an S8 with a freshly stripped ingots back in 1985. The rest of the photos show the reheat furnaces, the roughing stand, and what I call Thor's hammer hanging over the hanging over the rolling mill. If a slab gets hung up in the rolling mill, they just drop this big old piece of steel right down onto it and force the slab to go into the rolling mill. It's it's quite the sight. The next shot is the uh, is the coil box where they roll the where they roll the bar up and then unroll it the other way and put it through the finishing mill. Universal Stainless in Bridgeville, PA is another one of our customers. I had gotten a call to repair a ladle heater burner and grabbed two lo local helpers to get this done. We were on a raised platform between the electric furnace and the AOD furnace, both of which were cooking. The electric sounds like a million angry bumblebees and the AOD is nearly silent, all smoke and fire. While there, one of my helpers turned and said, I think we're in hell. I just laughed. I said, this is big steel, my man. When we were there, they poured and slagged off the heat. And I got a shot of the AOD reflected in the crane glass. <clears throat> the next couple shots show ingots on a furnace car. They have a skin on them, which must be, re must be removed by grinding it off, which is shown in the following pictures. The sound in that grinder bay is incredible. You can't hear yourself think. 
but it makes for a beautiful sight as they take off that outer skin. And now for a little shot. Wormwood tool in West Virginia's Northern Hand Handle. It's a small shop, sword shop, where they make just about every striking tool known to man. Been in operation for over 100 years, still to this day operates Monday through Friday making tools. And this is a few views of them making uh, spike pullers for the railroad. The railroad happens to be one of their main customers all over the United States. The rack of parts that they just made them. There's two or three other steps after this, but we'll take care of that. And finally, a shot I call Twilight. At the time in the early 1980s, warning signs were on, signs were on the horizon when Keith and I got this mixed Pittsburgh and Lake Erie eastbound freight crossing the Monongahela River, bisecting the lower end of U.S. Steel's Homestead Works. No closures had started, mostly due to the severe recession, and by this time Homestead was beginning to feel the pressure. By the end of the decade, Homestead was completely shut down. Developers were carving it up for residential and commercial makeover. The PNLE was absorbed into CSX in the early 90s, and now you can shop at the waterfront on this very site. Progress, I guess. And from outsider to insider has been a 30-year journey and a good one. I've met a lot of good people and seen some incredible sites along the way. Thank you for joining me, and thank you to the CRRPA for letting me uh, have a few minutes of your time. Nice. Okay, Kevin, now I'm going to pass the baton over to the other Kevin. Okay. Got it. Give me a second here. I lost my uh, access. There we go. Sorry about that. I had it and it disappeared. You are sharing your screen. Um, looks like you just need to hit play from our side of things. Oh, you can see the, the presentation? Yep. Great. So, Southern West Virginia, and particularly the New River Gorge region has attracted me for the majority of my life. In fact, the call of those mountains was a big reason I turned my back on the golden sunshine of California and moved back east. Initially, I was stunned by the beauty of the mountains, but as I looked past the surface, I came to admire the rich cultural beauty as well. The history is fascinating. The coal mining past is both awesome and horrific. The traditions in literature and, mu and music are significant. People love their nation. There are strong family ties to family, religion, home, and legends. It's a place of both beauty and tragedy. I've often felt that if some of the events that occurred in West Virginia over the years had occurred in New York or California, they would be front page news for months and they would end up in history classes. But a lot of West Virginia stories are kept home. They're a possession guarded by those mountain walls. For many years, I focused my photography on the railroads in West Virginia. That's what drew me to Thurman for the first time on Friday, September 14th, 1984. My good friend Keith Klaus was along for the trip and we were in my brand new AMC Jeep Cherokee. Using a good atlas of West Virginia County road maps, we found the narrow road off US 19 following Dunloop Creek down into the New River Gorge and across the combination railroad and road bridge. 
made a little clunk to stop, but I was distracted. I was amazed at the sight of the town. The old depot sort of leaned toward the river and the remaining vestiges of its paint stung, clung stubbornly to the board and batten siding. A committee of dogs at the agent's office were unimpressed by a couple of strangers with cameras. No one else was around, so we explored the town. We caught a coal train crawling through headed eastbound for Hinton. It was getting late in the day and we needed dinner at a motel. So we made plans to return the next morning. As soon as I backed the Jeep up, I heard, um, I, I knew that something was wrong. It made a significant grinding noise in the rear end and it did move. So we limped about 20 miles to Beckley. Uh, 7 p.m. on a Friday evening was not a good time to be broken down in Beckley, especially with an exotic vehicle like an American Motors Jeep. Luckily, there was an AMC dealership with a friendly salesman that gave us a ride to a motel. And the next morning I made a couple of calls. The car dealer said that my Jeep had a bad bearing in the rear differential and needed an entire new rear axle, which would take a number of weeks to get shipped in. The local AAA guy from Beckley Truck and Wrecker gave us a ride to his garage in a whale of an old Cadillac with country music blaring out of the rear speakers. Although I felt a bit stranded and panicky, uh, he was insistent on showing us the stock car he had just built for the races that night. Uh, we feigned great interest because he was also going to arrange a rental car for us from the used car lot across the street. It's too bad we couldn't rent, rent this car. Uh, eventually we were mobile again in a rented banana yellow Renault Le Car, which is not exactly optimal for the muddy dirt service roads that we would be testing it on, but at least we were gonna be moving again. So my first visit to Thurmond was memorably misfortunate we paid another visit the next morning. It was as if a town from the 1920s was preserved in amber. All the appliances of the steam era were still in place. The classic depot anchored the entrance to the town proper. To the east was a small yard, just to the west and across the tracks. The old CNO Railroad Commissary Building was tight against the tracks. It functioned as a U.S. post office, and it was the spot where you'd pass the time with your neighbors around the coal stove. Next to the post office were two large water tanks, one shaped like a beer can, one like a wine glass. A weeded lot next to them was where the railroad had squeezed in a turntable. The commercial district came next. It almost looked like someone took a city block of three and four story buildings and plopped them right down next to the tracks. Most of the buildings were abandoned and roofless, but the sturdy brick and stone walls provided a hint of past prosperity. The last building in the row was the formal, former National Bank of Thurmond. It was in fact a going concern, though not as a bank. It was owned by Erskine and Jackie Pugh as a hotel, restaurant, and watering hole known as the Bankers Club. Directly across the main line was a 1922 era CNO concrete coaling tower, a functioning water column, a sand facility, and a, and a wooden two track locomotive shop. Flat ground was so rare that the engine house uh, was actually partially built on wooden stilts above the New River. The whole center section of that was about 15 feet up off the ground. And you can see it wasn't in great condition even back then. It's the blacksmith shop area. A little further along, a single lane road swooped down off the mountainside. Fatty Lipscomb's boarding house, the other hostelry in town, is the large white building on the lower right. Most residents of Thurmond lived up on the mountainside in small cottages literally carved into the slope. A very narrow single lane road served the homes. We went up the hill to the and looping around and back down to the tracks at Fatty's. I fell in love with the town. The residents were friendly. No one bothered you while you walked around with a camera. There were so many interesting things packed into a tiny area that you had to spend some time there. And there were the ghosts. You could feel the stories around you if you took the time to look and uncover them. I started reading anything that I could find about West Virginia and particularly the New Forge. It 
it became apparent that there was a very strong literary tradition in those mountains, especially fiction writers, which I suppose is an offshoot of the storytelling tradition. Writers like Davis Grubb, Brees DJ Pancake, Homer Hickam, Denise Giardina, Anne Pancake, Keith Millard, Lee Maynard, and that great Sasquatch of American literature, Chuck Kinder. Chuck wrote about Thurmond in his fictional memoir, The Last Mountain Dancer, Hard-Earned Lessons in Love, Loss, and Honky-Tonk Outlaw Life. As Chuck wrote in the prologue to the book, the lonesome whistles of coal trains passing forlornly in the night figure prominently in my personal romantic sense of West Virginia, as does White Line Fever, Roadhouse Romance, and the sad slow dance of Jukebox Heartbreak. Although the trains are what drew me to Thurmond in the first place, they aren't what I enjoyed the most. I began to bring along a four by five camera to capture everything that I could. Taking this particular photo caused me fits. Even if you've never used a large format camera, I'm sure you've seen the image of a photographer hunched down under a dark cloth fiddling with the camera. That was me. I was adjusting the rising front element, using the swings and tilts to get the proper perspective of the station and eliminate keystoning of the vertical lines. After a while, I realized that the whole damn station was leaning in several directions were only making it look worse. Using the larger format did force me to slow way down though and study what I was choosing to include in the frame and think about what I wanted to photograph. The more deliberate pace allowed me to really see what was in front of me. Looking past the trains, I noticed the bones of the town. The new river provided a constant murmur and a fresh smell. The mountainsides meant that direct sunlight was limited. Since the town was on the north bank, it received a good swath of sun during the afternoon. Most of the homes found a spot for a vegetable garden at the end of a narrow path with some stone steps. And there was always a wash line, a coal pile for heating, and a parking spot. Little details emerged to me, like an ancient metal porch chair, a small hole cut into the side of the post office, especially to fit the handle of the mail cart, an old official lock on the on the mailbox, and the well used door latch on the post office. At the engine house, an innovative automatic door closer and delicate lattice work on the houses. The people I met were interested in the in drive all the way from Pittsburgh just to take pictures of their little town. The mayor of Thurmond, seen here, spent a good while talking to me on one of my visits. She was proud as could be of her town and the attention it started getting. My wife Dory was along on many of my visits, and she was even game enough to spend a night in the Bankers Club. You have to understand that the guest rooms were on the second floor and the accommodations weren't quite on the quality. The windows were right at stack level of coal trains crawling through town during the night. She only stayed there once, but she liked Thurmond, and often she would write when I was crawling all over the town taking pictures. She was amused one time when I came back to the vehicle with a watermelon I'd found growing outside an abandoned house. But I didn't tell her that I risked stepping over a copperhead on the path to that house. I counted 72 times that I visited Thurman since that first visit in 1984. Hollywood discovered the town in 1986 when filmmaker John Sales used it, used it to stand in for the title town in the movie Mate One about the incident that touched off the great West Virginia mine wars in the 1920s. He even used Fatty Lipscomb's house in his, a prominent role in the movie as a boarding house. The Bankers Club held a public auction of all their assets in 1989. It was heartbreaking to watch Mrs. Pugh pass through the crowd, passing out souvenir trinkets of her and her late husband's business. That's her in the blue jacket there in the middle. The depot and much of the property in town was sold to the National Park Service in 1991. The original development concept plan envisioned the town as being the focus and main visitor center for the New River Gorge National River, which is now the newest national park. 
Houses were to be restored for exhibits and possible lodgings. The commercial buildings would be sold to vendors. The engine house and surrounding tracks would be developed for rail exhibits, including steam and diesel locomotives. And the active tracks were to be fenced off and an underground pedestrian tunnel would connect the town to the engine house area. Of course, that formal plan was a wish list that was never funded. Uh, the budget was a total of $35 million back in 1992. So it'd be significantly higher today. Uh, the, and as you can imagine, the railroad was not exactly thrilled about the park service bringing a bunch of visitors into close proximity with their main line. Coal was first mined in the New River Gorge by Joseph Berry in 1873. The CNO Railroad had just completed its main line through the gorge, and it wouldn't take long for coal trains to spring up shoulder to shoulder, for coal towns to spring up shoulder to shoulder along the length of the gorge. All of them had a temple. So also had a beehive cubs. Just west of Thurman, the railroad makes a nearly 180 degree bend around a mountain to the town of Barry. Uh, it was quite prosperous in its day with churches, a bottling plant, and a large company store. Uh, that's the ruins of the company store seen here. Melsenia Fields moved to Barry in the 1930s and stayed on after the town died in the late 1950s. She lived a hermit's existence, surviving on groceries and coal given to her by passing train crews. Melsenia stayed in the ruins of this company store. She would move from room to room as the, seal, as the uh, roof collapsed around her. Um, in 1992, the crews noticed that she wasn't picking up her groceries and they found her body shortly afterwards. When I visited Barry a few years later, I noticed ornaments that Melsenia had attached to the trees at eye level. I later learned that this was an old mountain tradition to ward away haints or evil spirits that might be walking in the woods. In the 1990s, the Loop Creek branch out of Thurman experienced a revival. It was operated first by the West Virginia Southern, a local company with a small switcher serving the Georgia Pacific plant up on the mountain in Mount Hope, and was later sold off to R.J. Corman when a mine further up the track in the town of Pax started shipping trainloads of coal down to the main line. It was pretty exciting for the rail fan to see a big branch line coal operation, and I was happy to follow a light set of CSX engines heading up to the mine. I had one photo in mind that I've been waiting for years to get. The tracks passed by some houses not far from Thurmond, one of which had an old red Edsel parked in the front yard. My plan was to get that shot and follow the engines all the way up to the mine. I parked next to the Edsel and noticed a man sitting on the porch of the house. Mind if I take some pictures of the train and the car? Go right ahead, he said. After the engines passed, I went over to thank the man before returning to the chase. Two hours later, I was still standing there on that porch. Danny Bloxton had lived at that house for many years and had raised a family there. He was an operator for the CNO, working stations throughout the entire area. He purchased that 1959 Edsel Ranger brand new and still had the owner's manual. A lot of people ask about it, some want to buy it, but I kind of like it there, he said. On August 21st, 1993, the engine house burned to the ground under mysterious circumstances. I happened to be in the area and was there the next day. Along with it went much of the hopes for the Interpretive Railroad Museum. In 1994, the Park Service did restore the depot as a visitor center and an Amtrak stop. They found that the building had its distinctive lean because there was no foundation under it. So they jacked the whole thing up, they poured a footer under it and set the thing back down straight. The two water tanks were removed in 1999 and so it became homogenized like so much of the railroad landscape in recent years. Change always happens, but in a place like Thurmond, 
change only adds more to the layers onto the sense of place. As the country song says, how can I miss you if you don't go away? Let's take a long look at some of the changes that have occurred in Thurmond. Thurman, the place will always be there, living in leg legends and ghosts, in smells and echoes. And I don't think there's a better place to be sitting on a warm summer evening, right next to the, sitting on the tailgate, next to the tracks, to open up a cold beer, listen to the river, and watch the eastbound signal turn green, and notice a thin drone as a coal train grinds up the gorge far away. It passes by about 20 minutes later with a blinding headlight and shaking ground. A raised beer can salute to an unseen engineer and a marker light in what seems like 600 cars later. The silence returns, the conversation returns, all the problems of the world are solved. Open up another one and enjoy the world. Thank you. Well, Haley, you're in charge from here on out. I'm packing the car to drive to Thurman right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've shared some good times there. It's a, it's a tremendous place. Oh, well, I've, I've come to appreciate it so much more from, from your and, well, and also Dory's experiences there and, and all of the incredible storytelling and literary and folk traditions that come out of those mountains. It's just a, yeah, what, a, what an incredible place. Thank you both for rich, that. Rich. Yeah, it really is. Well, in the Steel Valleys of Pennsylvania, too. I mean, what what uh, what evocative places and what an incredible role the railroads played in both of them. One question I had for both of you, um, when I was putting together our Donald Furler book last year, I, it really helped me better understand the incredible industrial prominence of, of northeastern Pennsylvania, uh, you know, up around Bethlehem and Allentown and some of those places. and and just the incredible transformations that have happened since then. And I'd, I'd be curious to hear both of you say a little bit about how the kind of the deindustrialization of the Northeast has affected the places that you've photographed. Kevin, you have any comments? Most of, most of what, most of what, uh, most of what I shot is pretty much all gone. The later years stuff, as you can see, the got tier steel is still exists, but for the most part, U.S. Steel's down to one, just three plants in the valley. Aliquippa's leveled. Um, all the J and L plants around Pittsburgh are all gone. I mean, it, it's a natural move. The uh, business just cha simply changed, and many mills took over, and, and the big heavy-duty steel mills just they got eaten alive by smaller, more nimble competition. So. The air's cleaner here now, so. <laughs> yeah, steel mills, that was, that was a real paradigm change where the industry just pretty much went away. And you know, all the steel that's ever been made, as long as they've been making steel, is all still around. And it gets remelted and reused, so there's not much need for basic steel like what we were photographing in Pittsburgh. So it's unfortunate to see that, but you know Pittsburgh luckily is, has been able to thrive since then. Uh, not as interesting photographically, but it's challenging for the photographer to try to um, kind of portray what, what those changes have brought about. And you just look in different directions. Yeah, that leads into a question that um, one of our board members, Kevin Keefe, asked if you've ever, either of you have ever shot in Northwest Indiana around Gary or East Chicago or around Burn Harbors. Yeah, we, we both did some shooting up there and the, the, um, it was kind of late 
that we started shooting probably after uh, in the in the last 10 years or so. Uh, but of course, access is, is pretty limited. You know, those mills don't really. It's hard to get. Uh, we've we found a few places where we can get in and shoot. Uh, and it, it's just you know, the, the atmosphere is overwhelming. You know, the atmosphere in a steel town, uh, you can smell it, you can taste it. Uh, you can certainly hear it. Uh, it's it's just overwhelming. It, it's hard to portray it in a photograph. Kevin, when were you last in uh, in in Thurmond? What was your last time there? Uh, January twenty twenty. I stopped oh, down. Okay. Let's just see what what's happening down there. So mm -hmm. last. How, how does last, it compare to? How does it compare right now? It's. Uh, as I mentioned in my talk, it, it's been sanitized, it's homogenized, but you know the trains are still running, the river's still running, uh, uh, all the the buildings and everything are still there, but they you know they haven't been uh, developed as much. It's it's like a a brand new abandoned town, uh, so it, it's still interesting photographically. I mean the quality of the light down there is still excellent. Um, so yeah, I, it's a place I enjoy. Bob Crone asked if the, uh, the nearby station in Prince is still worth a visit. I would assume so, but it's been it's, it's been sadly been a few years since I've been there too. Yeah, I haven't I haven't been back. I think they closed that station. Uh, they they closed the uh, the clerk that was working inside, uh, and I haven't been back. But it's still uh, it it's definitely worth a visit. Just architecturally, it's it's worth seeing and photographing. I know from social media that uh, Marvin Plumley, the longtime uh, Amtrak agent there, has you know, obviously since retired, but he's still in the area, and I think he occasionally will lead uh, historic tours for for people. I think the CNO Modelers Group might be doing one of those next weekend, so oh. uh, perhaps there'll be there'll be more of those in the future. That would sure be a he'd be the right person to get the the perspectives on there. Yeah, absolutely. Hmm. And Kevin, what would you say is the the main economy that's left in that part of rural West Virginia. Oh my gosh, uh, there's still a little bit of coal mining. They don't employ nearly as many people. Um, it, it's really fallen on hard times. And actually, what they're trying to build up is tourism. You know, the new for tourists. There's rafting groups that go through there, and a lot of rock climbing, a lot of hiking, a lot of um, Nature hikes. There's a tremendous population of of raptors in the New River Gorge that are fun to watch. Uh, so they they get a lot of money from tourism, but as far as industry and everything, not too much left. Mm -hmm. uh, Scott, do you have any other more questions or any other questions on your end? No, I think it looks like we've covered what came in. Um, just want to thank Kevin and Kevin both again for for sharing such wonderful and meaningful work with us. Uh, and as I said earlier, uh, both of them have photographs in our, our upcoming Robert in the Art of Place and anthology book. Uh, and I think, um, you know, these these kind of deep explorations of places are a big part of what that book's about. So if you enjoyed these these talks today, make sure to, to check that out. Um, available now for pre-order on our website and, and we'll start shipping those uh, probably in September, I would say, maybe even a little bit earlier, depending on, on the shipping and printing dates. But um, yeah, thank you both for for sharing your work with us and uh, and and taking us on on two really meaningful tours. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity.